Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this recorded part of our service on Trinity Sunday. Trinity Sunday is a day when we are invited to reflect upon the greatness, wonder, and mystery of our God. God who is one, yet revealed to us in three very distinct ways. A Father God who loves us and creates us. Jesus, the Redeemer, who comes into the world to show us the face of God and to die on the cross for us. And the Holy Spirit, who comes to be with us today, to reveal Jesus to us today and to work with us in the world today, to help us to show Jesus in the world about us. Trinity Sunday is a challenge for all of us to think about what God really means to us and for us. And at the heart of this Trinity God is community, a God who communicates with himself, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And out of the love that that community has for each other, creation happens. And so we've got a lot to celebrate today as we come together. We're going to start with a prayer. Father God, you are at the heart of creation. Your word, Jesus, brings life into being, and your Holy Spirit reveals your Son to us today. We draw near, seeking your love in our hearts, your wisdom in our minds, your power in our lives. Receive us with grace in the name of your Son. Amen. As I said, Trinity Sunday can be a challenge for all of us. But really, the Christian faith is about a journey, a journey of discovery. We grow in faith and we grow in our understanding of faith as we go through each day. We have our eyes open to Jesus as we read his word. We learn more about God in the world about us. And there is so much that we learn about God when we talk with each other and we hear each other's stories. God has always been a little bit of a mystery, however. And at the heart of God, there is this understanding that God is always becoming that which he is becoming. In the beginning of the Bible, there is a lot there to underline for us the fact that God is many things. And I'm going to take just a few moments this morning to reflect on some verses from Genesis chapter 1 and some verses there that tell us more about the wonder of our God. So first of all, some verses from Genesis uh, chapter 1, verses 1, 2 and 3. I've highlighted here some words which are really important to ponder. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Here at the beginning of the Bible, God is described as being one God. God there is in the singular. And this singular God is the one who creates. But it's not as simple as that, because already in verse 2, we have a phrase there that describes God as spirit. It was the spirit of God hovering over the waters at the beginning and through the spirit that we have creation because God said, let there be light. In verse three there, God said, it's God's spokenness that brings creation into being. A wonderful parallel there with the gospel of John chapter one, verses one to three where Jesus is the word made flesh who comes to dwell with us. And we are told in the Gospel of John and in Colossians chapter 1 that all things come into being through Jesus. He was there at the beginning of creation. So already at the start of the Bible, we have this wonderful understanding, this mystery of who God is. Also in Genesis, verses 26 and 27, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, 
over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Notice here in verse 26 that this singular God is now talking to himself. Let us make mankind in our image. This tells us something about the community that exists within God. And of course, this community that exists within God created God in his own image. And verse 27 there tells us that God created mankind or humankind in his image and male and female, he created them. And so maleness and femaleness is also at the heart of God. We can begin to see then that whilst we think of God as being one, he is many things. Jesus did something similar in his own, life, in his own lifetime, in his ministry. He went along and as he met people, he became different things to different people. So to those who were sick, he was the healer. To those who were the outcasts, he was the one who welcomed them home. To those who were lowly, he lifted them up. And the same is true today. God comes to be with us wherever we are, and he gives us hope. Catherine is going to read for us this morning, and she's also going to do the talk. I'm going to hand over now to Catherine. The Gospel reading for today is Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age. So as we think about that reading, it seems a little bit out of sync with some of the other readings we've had. Just a week ago, it was Pentecost, and just before that, it was Ascension. So we seem to be winding back to that time just before Ascension. But that's because today in the church's calendar is Trinity Sunday, when we think about God as Trinity. So you'll know that word Trinity, but I wonder if you feel like you understand it. We say it in our creed. God is three in one, that we believe in Father, Son and Holy Spirit. But what do we really mean by that? There are very few Bible references that specifically talk about the Trinity, which makes it a really difficult topic to get to the bottom of, and one that many theologians have spent many hours pondering over and writing about. The thing is that our human minds can't fully grasp God. God is above us and beyond us, as it says many times in the Bible. Our language has limits, and even when we try to explain things, we can't get exactly what we mean always. We see things from an earthly perspective too. So how can we explain the Trinity? We even struggle from the beginning. One God, but in three, what? Parts? Sounds like a broken machinery. Pieces? Persons? That sounds too human and fallible. If we think about the Trinity, we can make some misconceptions easily too. Sometimes we think of God the Father as being more powerful because he is the Father and we turn the Trinity into a hierarchy. The Holy Spirit is described by Jesus as the helper, so sometimes we think of that as being more subservient. But of course, they're equal. We're also tempted to allocate certain roles or functions to each person of the Trinity, perhaps because we want to categorise to try and understand. But that can limit our perceptions of what God can do and who God is. Imagery can help a little. So St Patrick reportedly suggested a shamrock leaf that's got the three rounded bits on it, but it's one leaf. Others have suggested H2O, it comes in the form of water, ice and steam. 
Celtic Christians painted and carved triketras, which are curving shapes that have three points which interlock and a circle that goes round as well. These images can all help, but they're only partial and imperfect descriptions. We can and should try to think and read about the Trinity. But more importantly, we need to think about moving from our head into our hearts and souls and experiences when we think about God. In the Christian faith, we talk about meeting Jesus, feeling the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing God as our Father. And all of those are to do with experience and relationship. And those are things which are first revealed in the Trinity. God experiencing relationship within the Trinity from before the beginning of time. We may not know quite what that means or how that works, but we can understand something of relationship because we are made to be relational people and we are born into relationships. We long to be with others, to communicate and to share and one of the difficulties of this lockdown has been the limiting on that sharing and being with people and communicating. It's reduced contact and so it's left people feeling isolated and lonely. God in the Trinity demonstrates togetherness and mutual love which continually flows between them. And we too are included in this picture. God is a family and he invites us to join his family, to become the children of God, to become, in a sense, part of the Trinity. There's a famous Bible passage which is read at weddings from 1 John chapter 4. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Again, it's difficult to quite understand what abiding might mean, but it's to do with that togetherness that God is together in his three persons. We can be together with God. We can become part of the family of God in the church that we celebrated last week at Pentecost. Another interesting thing about this gospel passage is to do with activity. Our human minds often think of God as static and still, and perhaps that's to do with stained glass windows or pictures in Bibles. Or perhaps it's because we like to pin him down to being just one thing. But the story of God in the Bible is a story of movement and change and activity. God isn't still. He's active. He walks in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. He goes before the people of Israel at the Exodus. Jesus takes his ministry on the roads around Galilee and eventually to Jerusalem. He goes up mountains and into gardens to pray, as well as being in towns and cities. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove at Jesus' baptism and falls in a rushing wind and tongues of flickering fire at Pentecost. Several writers have tried to say something about the Trinity in continual movement, like a dance of love. Other theologians write about God's continual activity in the world, whether we notice it or not. And in today's reading, there's activity too. Go and make disciples, baptise them and teach them. The disciples go up the mountain to meet Jesus before he ascends into heaven, and he speaks his final words to them. But in the translation from Greek to English, we sometimes miss that sense of activity intended in the verb forms that are used for Jesus' words. We often read, go as the imperative, the command word. And I've heard it used in the past to say that we should be physically going somewhere on a kind of special mission to do God's work. But actually, the Greek tense means something more like as you go about life or while you journey. And the command word instead is disciple. As we go about our lives, we are commanded to disciple others teaching and baptising them into the faith of the Trinity. And what is discipleship? Well, again, sometimes we imagine a static kind of learning where the disciple listens at the rabbi's feet, makes notes and ponders carefully. But being a disciple was actually more like an apprenticeship, learning by doing 
and learning through relationship. That relationship was vital to its success. Think about a skill, a hobby or a knack that you've got. How did you learn it? Maybe you learned to cook from your mum or knitting from a grandparent or fixing things from an uncle. Often we learn from those that we're close to, those we spend time with, and we might not even realise that we've learned something. Jesus spent time with his disciples. He befriended them and took them with him, showing them as he went and talking through what he'd done so that they would learn from his example. So his words at the end of Matthew's gospel mean, as you go through life, share your life and your faith with the people around you. Talk to me, show them my ways, include them into the family too. So on Trinity Sunday, reflecting on the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit as Trinity can help us to see something of the greatness of God, the amazing richness of who he is and what he can do. But in the end, Trinity, three in one, however we understand it, isn't quite the full story. Through his grace, we are included in the family of God and that family should keep on growing as we obey his commands to disciple those around us. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, for our prayers today, if you would like to join in a response, when I say, generous God, would you respond, pour out your love? Generous God, pour out your love. We come to you, God of love, three persons in one, beyond our understanding. But you have shown us that you are a community of love. Trusting in your love for us, we pray for our community here in Strensel. We thank you for all who have brought help to others in this time of lockdown. May they be blessed in their help towards our well-being. Generous God, pour out your love. We pray for all who serve the wider community in our land, for workers keeping essential services going, for all those who work in hospitals and care homes. May they be protected and strengthened. Generous God, pour out your love. We pray for those who make decisions affecting our nation, for wisdom in these difficult times. May there be some changes to help our society overcome inequalities. Generous God, pour out your love. We pray for our world, for a change of heart in all those who fear or despise or hate people who are different in some way. May we all recognise our common humanity and the image of God in each one. Encourage peacemakers who can demonstrate your kingdom in areas of conflict, thinking particularly of the US at this time. Generous God, pour out your love. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for entering our world and becoming part of creation. May we grow in respect and love and wonder for the natural world, to enjoy its beauty and variety, and to care for it better. We thank you for people with creative gifts in worlds like drama and music and art that enrich our lives. We pray for the many whose work is on hold at present, that their contribution may soon be restored. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving your life for us that we might live. May more people come to know the fullness of the life that you offer. Generous God, pour out your love. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for bringing the light and energy and love of the presence of God to us wherever we are. We pray for all who are in need through trouble of body, mind or circumstances. And we especially remember those who grieve the loss of loved ones. In a moment of quiet, you may like to think of those for whom you are particularly concerned. 
May they know the comfort, hope, peace and healing that your presence brings. Generous God, pour out your love. And we end our prayers with the grace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and always. Amen. And so as we come to the end of this recorded part of our service, we hope that you've got a lot to think about and to be challenged about in your faith and daily walk with Jesus. I'm going to end now by saying a blessing. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God who is almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon us and remain with us now and always. Amen. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>